Hi there, this is Lee Davis, one of the pastors here at Berlin Church. To our Berlin Church family, we miss you. This is still a bit of an artificial way to reach you, but in this season it is still, of course, the most prudent thing for us to do. We do want you to know that we miss seeing you face to face, and it is still a little bit odd, to be really honest with you, to be preaching to a camera in an empty building but we're thankful that we do have this technology so that we can reach you. For those who perhaps are watching who are not part of our church family, thank you for joining us. This is a particularly unusual sermon for me because typically I would be preaching it to our folks at the start of Holy Week. So this will be our Palm Sunday sermon, the start of Holy Week. We will continue with an opportunity on Good Friday to worship together, so we will be sending you not only material for worship today, but for Friday, so that we can celebrate the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and the implications of that for our salvation, and then also for Easter, which is going to be hard. But this is the season that God has ordained. This has not caught him off guard, and so we're trusting him with this. I do hope that your faith is flourishing in this season. If you're like me, it's still a bit disorienting. I'm still kind of getting my footing during this time. But we are thankful now that we can come to a pretty customary season for us, Holy Week, even though we have to do it a bit differently. Palm Sunday is a really interesting Sunday. It is a Sunday that's mixed with tension. There is celebratory feel to the Gospels as they reveal to us the events of Palm Sunday. But we know at the same time that that celebration quickly ended. So if you grew up in perhaps a more liturgical tradition, you perhaps celebrated even with palm fronds on Palm Sunday and maybe even had some kind of procession through your sanctuary of some sort. But at the same time, we know that the crowds that had all this adulation for Jesus, the one that they recognized at least in part to be this Hosanna, the one who was the king that came from David's line to save the people, would turn on him just a few short days later. And so we come today to John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19, and I want to talk from this text about Jesus, the liberator. Let me read for us the text from John 12, verses 12 through 19. Then I want to recap the broader story and talk about what was going on in that day and how it applies to us. So please hear God's word. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And may God bless to us the reading of his word. John is unique among the four gospel writers in telling us the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Lazarus lived in a small town called Bethany, about two miles from Jerusalem, so it would be the equivalent of a modern suburb to some degree. Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, probably had some means. Perhaps they were even supporters of Jesus and his public ministry. But Lazarus, Jesus' dear friend, had died. And after four days, Jesus comes to the tomb, and as you perhaps know the story, raises Lazarus from the dead. A miraculous sign that only God can do. He who alone breathes life into mankind 
alone possesses the power to reanimate a dead human. Jesus proved himself to be God. In fact, in John chapter 11, where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he calls himself the resurrection and the life. This is foreshadowing what is about to happen to Jesus and through Jesus in a few short days when Jesus, through his own resurrection, would prove that he was going to alter history, ushering in salvation, conquest over sin and death. And though it should have been clear that Jesus was unlike any human that had ever lived, for though he was fully human, he was also fully God, there were mixed reactions to Lazarus' resurrection. Some believed in Jesus, seemingly accepting the unmistakable proof that he was the God-man who had come to conquer sin and death. However, some refused to accept the obvious truth and plotted his death. Some of them went to the council, the Jewish religious and civic leaders that we know as the Sanhedrin, and told them what had happened. They wanted to hang on to their power. They were greedy for gain. More on them in just a bit. What we can say at this point is that they wanted to eradicate any threat to their perceived freedom and power, both the people and their leaders. And so as a response to this, in the broader context in John 11 and 12, Jesus removed himself from the scene for just a bit, retiring to a little village called Ephraim, actually not very many miles from Jerusalem, but up in the hill country, he did not do this to get away from what was going on. He didn't do this to let things simmer down. He wasn't trying to get away from the danger that was brewing. In fact, he wanted the atmosphere to heat up. It was the season for the preparation for Passover. Jerusalem was likely in the first century around the time Jesus lived about 40,000 people, a good-sized city for its day. But at Passover season, the population would swell incredibly, perhaps by six times or more. So you easily could have had a quarter of a million people in the city of typically 40,000 people. And Jesus knew that the atmosphere would heat up both because of national pride and celebration around this most important of feasts, but also because the nature of Passover itself. Jesus retired for a bit to let things heat up, so to speak, to allow the fervor to grow. The simmering would grow to a boiling point. And perhaps even more importantly, Jesus knew that his crucifixion must happen specifically on Passover. This promised feast that the Jews had been celebrating now for many, many centuries. A perpetual reminder that God was a deliverer. What had the Jews, what had Israel been delivered from? Well, the original Passover was God's final judgment on Pharaoh and the Egyptians that his people might be released from the tyranny of the Egyptian bondage. At the original Passover, the Jews were to take an unblemished lamb and to take its blood and put it on the doorposts of their homes. And a death angel came over the land of Egypt on the night of Passover, and wherever the lamb's blood was painted on the doorposts, those houses were spared. But where the blood had not been painted on the doorposts from this unblemished lamb, the firstborn of every household died. An unmistakable judgment upon Egypt that their enslavement of God's chosen people, the Jews, was evil. And so God broke Pharaoh and Egypt's tyranny on this night of Passover. And so perpetually, for centuries, the Jews had been celebrating Passover 
as a reminder of God's deliverance from their enslavement, from their bondage. So Jesus holds off for a while in this little village called Ephraim up in the hill country to allow the atmosphere to come to a boiling point and also to wait for this highest of seasons and festivals whenever he would present himself as the chief and finalized and expected Passover lamb. The current overseers of the land, not the Jews themselves, but the Romans, because they were in charge. This was their empire. They were not as bad as Pharaoh and the Egyptians, at least in some senses. The Jews were a proud people, and like anyone else, they wanted to live freely without being under the thumb of Rome. And the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, which I told you we would talk just a bit more about, walked a tightrope. They enjoyed immense privilege as the most esteemed religious and civic leaders in the nation. But they were afraid of Rome. Rome was unlike Egypt in the sense that they allowed their subjects in the far-flung corners of their empire to still worship according to their traditions. But Rome was like a contented but lethal lion. It ruled over a vast empire, and as long as you stayed quiet, the lion would not pounce. But if you started making noise, particularly if you posed a threat through some kind of nationalistic movement or for independent self-governance, the lion would be roused, and the defenseless Jews who had no military might could do nothing to stop the lion pouncing on its prey. And so the Jewish council walked a tightrope. They enjoyed the freedom, which was better than the original enslavement in Egypt, but yet they lived under the tyranny, the threat of having their freedom removed at any point. And so Jesus stepped right into this setting, and he knew full well what was coming. But Jesus did not come into the city on a stallion. There were no chariots. There were no weapons of war. He comes into the city, as we read, on a young donkey. Hardly the actions of one seeking to rouse the people up into following him into a military coup. Jesus did not come to lead the Jewish people to military freedom. Back in Exodus chapter 12, where Moses records for us the original Passover, we find these words. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. This is the month that we know of as Nisan. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, in the tenth of Nisan, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. The Jewish calendar revolved around their feasts. And this Passover, which happened on the 15th of Nisan, began at twilight, at night, in the evening of the 14th. But four days before this, on the 10th of Nisan, they were to take their best lamb, inspect it, and make sure that it was ready to be slaughtered on the 14th, so that on the 15th, they could celebrate the Passover. This, again, perpetual reminder of all that God had done for them in delivering them from Egypt. Jesus entered into Jerusalem on this donkey as a humble servant, not a conquering king, on the tenth of Nisan, presenting himself as an unblemished lamb, reminding us of how John's gospel begins. 
In John chapter 1, Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist, actually his cousin. And John the Baptist cries out to the crowd there at the Jordan who had come to see this spectacle because John was a bit of a spectacle. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as Jesus entered into Jerusalem on this young donkey, on the tenth of Nisan, he presented himself as the Lamb of God, who in just a few short days would take away the sins of the world. Jesus came to offer himself as an unblemished, perfect sacrifice. He would not be killed for his own sins, for he had none, but for our innumerable sins. He offered himself as a perfectly righteous sacrifice in order to bear our punishment and to offer us his blood that alone can cover our sin and reconcile us to God. And this is why he entered the city as he did. Jesus proved through Lazarus' resurrection that he was the resurrection and the life. But a far greater resurrection had to take place, which would occur, of course, after his death, which we will celebrate throughout the rest of Holy Week. Just like the original Passover fell in the first month of the Jewish year, Jesus offers us a new beginning to receive his righteousness and cease from seeking to foolishly establish our own, something we can never do no matter how hard we try. So again, Jesus did not enter into Jerusalem on a stallion seeking to lead a military coup, but as a humble servant who was willing to lay his life down for his people. Jesus entered into the fray, into this boiling atmosphere at just the right prescribed time under God's amazing providence. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus entered into the den of adders, right into the middle of the fire, right into the heart of the darkness, that he might deliver us and give us light and hope. We get some sense of this right now. We are living in a day and age where people are socially distancing. We are staying away from one another. Yesterday I went to my favorite Kroger store to get some food. My boys are on spring break, can't go anywhere, but they love it when I grill. So I went to the grocery store yesterday to see what I could find so that we could grill and try to make a nice dinner out of an otherwise kind of difficult season. The way to my boys' hearts is often through grilling meat. So as their dad, who wants to give them as good a spring break as I can, went to Kroger. As I was over in the meat section on that back wall of my favorite Kroger, I accidentally got too close to a young lady pushing a cart. She must have been 22 or 23. wasn't really looking and paying attention, and I uh, got kind of close to her with my cart, and she sort of jumped out of the way. She was scared just to be near me. In a normal season, she probably wouldn't have thought twice about it. But we live in a day and age where we're sort of scared to be around each other because of this invisible thing that we don't want to catch and spread around. And and rightly so, we should be prudent. Please do not misunderstand me. Follow our government and health care officials. Be wise. But at the same time, we're not accustomed to living this way. It's, It's still a bit odd. Christians throughout the centuries have shown us what it looks like to live during pandemics. This is not the first pandemic that Jesus' church has faced. In fact, as you go back through church history, it's relatively clear that one of the ways that Christians witnessed best to the populace around them was by being willing to help those who otherwise were helpless. We live in a season right now where we have to measure that out. While we should socially distance We also are not afraid to run to those who have needs. Jesus especially showed us what this was like. 
Jesus was born into a poisoned environment. Jesus was used to breathing the air of heaven, which is pure and holy. Instead, he came into a world where there is infection, the disease of sin. But he didn't run away from it. He didn't despise this mission. He didn't try to talk the Father out of this. This was a pre-foundation of the world agreement among the persons of the Godhead that Jesus, the Son of God, would come to this world, down into this diseased planet, to breathe our air and to walk our sod and to give us the hope of life. And so Jesus saw his mission of redemption as joy, despite the fact that It would cost him his very life. So Jesus enters into Jerusalem knowing full well what's going to come. And though the crowds initially laud him as the king who was going to deliver him, them, they did not want salvation from what their real problem was. They wanted salvation from Rome. Jesus offered them a salvation which went far deeper. These people wanted freedom, abolition from their current enslavement. But their greatest oppression was not from Rome. Their greatest oppressor was their own sin. They, like all of humanity, needed to be liberated from sin's evil reign, which of course is wrapped up in their very story. Their original abolition from from enslavement to the Egyptians was part of their national identity. But the Old Testament often used this, this story of freedom from the Egyptian enslavement to point them to the greater problem that they had, that they had been enslaved to sin. And what of the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin? They saw where this was headed. They were afraid. They were greedy. And because of their fear and because of their greed, they had become bloodthirsty. They were willing to go to any length to maintain the status quo. They saw the people going after Jesus, some with real faith and some with calculated faith, hoping that he would bring them a militaristic transition from Roman rule to to good old Jewish rule. But the Jewish leaders, much like A lot of the people of the day wanted to preserve what they perceived to be what was best for them. The Jewish leaders, along with most of the people, were accustomed to to marginal freedom, but they were numb to their deeper need, their need to be freed from sin's tyranny. The Jewish leaders walked in the darkness, and they kept the people in darkness. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus says, let them alone, these Jewish leaders. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. The Jewish leader's treachery was guided by God, however, for the good of humankind. In Acts chapter 4, The early church prays, under threat from Jewish oppression. They say, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So Jesus did not enter into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the tenth of Nisan, as a helpless victim. He did this with sovereign intention resting under the providential hand of his Father. And God would use the rage of the Jewish leaders and the blindness and foolishness of the Jewish people to bring about his purposes. That this Lamb of God offered himself, and because they would change their cries from Hosanna to crucify him just a few short days later, this would result in Jesus' death 
which would be God's means of freeing humanity from its sin. Jesus will go on to say in John chapter 12 and verses 24 to 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In verses 27 through 43, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. At the end of this section, when Jesus had said these things, John records, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. There, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But then notice what John says. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, the place of Jewish civic and religious gathering. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Blind guides leading blind people. What do we do with all this on Palm Sunday? Well, it gives us a recognition that we all desire freedom. The abolition of enslavement to harsh rulers. But we must be careful to recognize what real slavery is. Unless we do, Jesus will always be viewed as a half measure. But Jesus, the liberator, calls for full measure faith. He is our only hope. For those of us who have trusted Jesus, our liberator, take heart. Our redemption has been secured. And Holy Week for us is a week of remembrance, a chance for gratitude and for rest. For those who have only seen Jesus as a half measure, you will never be freed from your sin with just a little bit of Jesus. You either must receive him in his entirety or not at all. So Christians, those who trust in Jesus, take heart. Your redemption has been secured. And I say to you, my friends, if you have not trusted Jesus, if he's only a half measure for you, a a half liberator, a token, you must turn from your dependence on your self-righteousness for you are no better than the crowds who merely want temporal salvation. Your real slave master, the one who really reigns over you, is sin. And Jesus has come to conquer that, offering himself as the perfect Lamb of God who has come to take away your sin. Place your faith in him and trust him. This Palm Sunday could be the day of your salvation. Berlin Church, we love you. Our guests, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon.